This evening we consider the sermon entitled Building and Protecting Our Household from 127 of the 127th Psalm. Building and Protecting Our Household. Now the traditional, the historic role of the man is to be provider and protector, to be husband and father, uh, to build up the household. It's not merely historic and traditional, it is biblical, and that's why men have rightly done this. And this is something that we celebrate when we remember fathers on this day as it is done in the world. Now, it is not wrong per se for our married sisters to work, uh, but men are primarily responsible to work and build up the family. Wives, they help. Now, Paul said that women, and he said this in Titus 2, they are keepers at home. You know, but you do have some mighty capable women. Uh, They can be keepers at home, and they can still run a business and manage staff uh, like the Proverbs 31 woman. But building a household is hard. Uh, We want success. I'm sure fathers here, husbands here, we want a good family. We want obedient children. Uh, We want a good job. We want people to look at our household and we desire them to say, wow, what a godly, successful household. You know, we do want households which are better run, supported, finance that are stable and have success. And sometimes the desire after this goal causes us, you know, to think of some legitimate things. Uh, Maybe at times it could be illegitimate. You know, we, we think programmatically. We think, oh, if we send our children to this school, Uh, then they'll be successful. Or if we live in this neighborhood, then things will be better. Or if we follow this method of child rearing, uh, we will have good children and we work hard to follow that plan. And sometimes, sometimes when we follow those plans, we become busy. We're really, really busy and sleep becomes an issue. And this really was the case with Solomon. You know, the psalm title here, A Song of Degrees for Solomon, it tells us uh, that this psalm was written for Solomon uh, by perhaps David or possibly under the direction of Solomon who gave this task uh, to someone, a psalm writer, or it can be also translated as a song of degrees of Solomon. Uh, Solomon himself uh, could have written it. After all, he he wrote the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs. So at the end of verse 2, this psalm refers, or the psalmist here refers to himself as uh, the beloved, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Now, this was how Solomon described himself in the Song of Solomon. He was the beloved. And we also know that he worked very hard. You know, he he needed sleep. We know he worked hard uh, from what he wrote in Ecclesiastes. So this psalm, this psalm tells us essentially that apart from God, life is pointless. You know, whatever you do, whatever you plan, whatever you strategize, if it is without God, then it's pointless. You know, you could be building a house, you could be securing a city, you'd be Uh, could be raising a family. And these are the three things that are described here. And if it is done without God, it is vain. And many of us, dearly beloved, many people in the world are trying to raise their families to protect what they have built, uh, to protect and to increase what they have invested, what they have earned, you know, their concern for safety, you know, and they do all of these things to try and secure the success of their families, their homes, etc. And it can be really difficult. So there are two truths that we can glean from this psalm. Uh, firstly, building and protecting our household without God 
is vain. Secondly, building and protecting our household is successful only with God's help. So firstly, building and protecting our household without God is vain. Now we see several things that people, even Solomon as a man, was trying to build and protect. Verse one says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. So here we see two things, build the house and uh, keep the city. Now many of us, we try to build our house. And when I say it in that way, I'm not saying that we're all builders trying to construct our house. You know, the Bible has or uses two ways or uses the word house in two ways, you know, in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, that word house can literally mean house or it can mean household, a family, a life. You know, in first, or rather in 2 Samuel 7, uh, David told God that he would build him a house, a, a literal palace, Hekal, a, a literal place where God uh, would dwell in, in among his people in a permanent location, in a permanent building that was not the tabernacle, which was foldable and packable and movable, but this house, and his desire was to honor God, that God would have finally this great place, this holy of holies, where his glory would reside between the wings of the cherubim in that chamber where he would dwell with his people, where that pillar of cloud would come and rest. And that represented God's presence with his people. Now, we know that that's not where God actually dwells. He dwells in heaven, you know, past the glass ceiling where the cherubim themselves are unable to proceed. And so David wanted to build God an earthly dwelling place to symbolize his presence on earth. Now, we know how well that planned uh, uh, was rolled out, right? God essentially told him, nope, I'm sorry, you're not going to build me a house, but I am going to build your household. So God countered it to say that I will build your household, your family, your heritage. Now, Solomon wrote this psalm, or he had it written for him, you know, and the fact that he, this was his psalm is significant. He would have known about this exchange between God and David. And so Solomon built the temple for God, and God was building David's household through Solomon. So the question that we have here is, which is meant? Which house is meant here? Now in verses three to five, Solomon speaks about family. So when it is spoken about building the house, it is not building a literal house, but building up a household. The household encompasses all areas of our life. This is what all of us do. You know, we finish school, and young people here, you, you know, you have to face up to the fact that you will have to do some adulting soon, you know, to think about, you know, savings, think about a job, think about a house, think about a family, think about children, think about all of these things. And so Solomon is referring to building up your life, your household, you know, not just from having security from a roof over your head, uh, but it also refers to having sufficient, saving sufficiently, having a successful marriage with successful children and a successful life. You know, this is what all of us desire to have, and this is what many of us are actively trying to build. Some of you. Young people, you're preparing for marriage. Others of you are newly married and you're having children, you're planning for them. Uh, some of you are in this COVID season, you know, renting because you can't buy and you're waiting for your BTOs to be finished. All right, so home acquisitions are on your mind. And once you acquire your homes, you think about home renovations. Those of you who have your homes and children, you're thinking about your children's education. And for some, when your children are reaching their tertiary education, you're thinking, oh, well, they have to take a bursary, a loan, or maybe they're smart enough to get a scholarship, whether local or international. And so you have to think. 
You have to labor. You have to pray. Perhaps you could be an empty nester or soon be. You have to think about how you will upkeep your income. You know, when is that insurance plan maturing? You know, how do you still help your children? Do they still need help? Do they need to pay, you know, for this and that? And how will you pay your medical bills? All of us in our lives, from young until old, we are thinking about building our houses. And that is why we also spend time guarding our households, our city, so to speak, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. So what we build, we will also try and spend time trying to protect. We watch like an alert watchman. We stay up, and the way we build and protect it can be quite intense. You know what happens when you have an investment? You have to watch it. You have to figure out whether it's going high, going low, what you're going to do with it, when's the right time to sell. You know, you have to think about all of these things. And verse 2 acknowledges how hard it is. And it says, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. You know, husbands and fathers here, I can understand what many of you face. I can also understand what some of you single mothers face as well. And not even single mothers. Those women who are sharing the work equally, or maybe not even equally with your husbands, you got to work and then you got to do more at home, right? But many of you are spending so much time keeping your household together so that things will flourish. You're like an octopus with many arms trying to figure out how to do many things. You desire the household to flourish, and therefore, as this psalm says, many of you sleep late, you wake up early, and we see here that sleep is the resource in this psalm. But of course, it can refer to other resources that God has given. You know, there's intelligence, there's time, the sun, the rain, your income. It tells us that God's resources are sufficient for our lives, You know, legitimately, sometimes we can enlarge upon them like good stewards, and we have to make sacrifices because if you need time, what must you do? You have to sacrifice sleep. If you need extra classes for your children, what must you do? You have to sacrifice income. You know, you invest in money, or you invest your money in a particular scheme, so you'll have to sacrifice things like that new fridge you really wanted to get or that holiday you wanted to take. So these are all legitimate decisions that we must make. But the problem is this that the psalm acknowledges. Sometimes we take that limited resource, we give up so much of it that we feel stress. We extend our resources irresponsibly. You know, we can skim on so much sleep in order to get more time. We can skim on worship and fellowship in order to manage our work. You know, we may even fudge our taxes. We may not even declare certain income to keep, you know, the money that we have. But as this verse reminds us, we may work very hard. We may even skim on sleep or work or give up other resources to protect what we have until it results in trouble. And the reason for that is because we do it sinfully. You know, some think, and ironically, we think, you know, I'll sacrifice all of this now in order to build up my life, which is a bit ironic. You want to sacrifice your life now to build up your life? All right? Some people will say, you know, I, I'm going to sacrifice my worship, my family, my rest, my fellowship, my time with my children so that I can build up my household in order so that I can worship, spend time with my family, and have rest and time with my children. This is the way we think. And the answer that God gives to this ironic, paradoxical way, you know, of, of thinking is that what you are doing is vain. I think all of us can identify. We give up these things to try and stabilize this in order to have what we give up. So Solomon uses the word vain. 
And the word vain here is different from the word vain in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, the word vain there means futile. It means messy. But the word vain here has a moral component. The word vain here means false or wrong. You want to build your house? You want to watch without God? It is false. It is wrong. Now, this word vain here means lies. It's the same word, you know, in, in the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. That's the same word. You know, or in the Psalms where it says, who can ascend to the holy hill? He that hath clean hands and pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to vanity, to lies. That's the same word. So, we can only pursue our lives without God if we believe in these lies. How many lies do we tell ourselves? I will neglect God. I'll neglect the fellowship of the saints. I won't send my kids to the fellowship of the church so that they can succeed when all of these things actually impede their lives. These are the lies that we believe. If only I can do this, oh, then my life will be better. If I can only sacrifice this now, I can gain it back later. If I can cut back on time spent with family to work, then they can have a better life. Now, why are these things lies? Because how can you sacrifice what God has freely given to gain what God has freely given? Because if you sacrifice what God has freely given, what makes us think that we will receive those things one day when we've sacrificed them? And we can't neglect God's resources and limitations without copying negative consequences. You know, what's the point of building up your household? If by being constantly absent because of work, your marriage and your family are ruined. You know, what's the point of investing in children by neglecting their fellowship for them to pursue success if they only become successful pagans? What's the point of losing sleep to build up your career if illness will end your career? What we're told here is the Lord gives his beloved sleep, rest, Sabbath rest, rest in God's provision, rest in his providence, rest at the cross, rest from lust. But what we are willing to do is to feed our lusts, thinking that we will have rest one day. But if we take not this rest, there will be turmoil. You know, we, we say, oh, just one more and it'll be okay. Meanwhile, we don't treasure our position as God's beloved. If you're too busy to sleep, you're too busy. Do you agree? If you're too busy to sleep, you're too busy. If you're too busy to worship, you're too busy. If you're too busy to spend time with the children, you're too busy. If you're too busy but think you can still build up your marriage and your family, uh, you're believing in lies, and thou shalt not bear false witness. And so the question that comes to us now is, are you a liar? And this is what we frequently struggle with. You know, we can believe these lies. We can deceive ourselves. But for some of you who are sitting here, how many years have you been saying this? It'll be okay one day. How many more years will you say this? If you don't make use of God's resources right now, how can he bless you? It, you think that by building and protecting your household sinfully now will automatically transform your household to be something spiritual? How can that be? Your poor use of resources now will continue because that is something that you're used to. And when you have what you want, the best house, the most accomplished family, the best job, uh, they will still not satisfy because your rest is not upon God, 
but it is upon your vanity. You know, you'll become used to your sinful use of resources. You know, Moses says in Psalm 90, verse 17, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. We have to know that God is the one that establishes the work of our hands. And we can't truly prosper without surrendering ourselves to God. Yes, we may prosper, but our hearts will not follow God. They will be steeped in vanity. And so for any of us here who think that we're sacrificing what God has given in order to gain what God has freely given at a later date, that's a vanity. So wives, if your husbands are like that, weep for them. And husbands, if your wives are like this, weep for them. Weep for yourselves. You know, by building and protecting without God, we're only tearing down and we're believing in lies. But secondly, the building and protecting of our household is successful only with God in it. Verses 3 to 5, they say, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, a successful household in the Old Testament was illustrated by the number of children. Lo, children are a heritage. They are a gift of the Lord. <laughs> and so we see even in Scripture there's a wrong way. There's a wrong way. In Genesis 11, the people of the world were very successful. They multiplied. They grew great in number. They filled the earth. Then all of them came to Shinar. And you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to build a tower to reach to the sky. And according to Genesis 11 verse 4, so that they could make a name for themselves. They wanted to do it without God. They wanted a name without God. And God frustrated their plans. Yes, they had many children. They had successful households. They were well organized. But God confounded them and he scattered them all because they tried to build without God. Now, on the contrary, uh, how did God really bless the world? What did he do? How did he give a man a real name? He took this one man, not just one man, but an old man. He took him from Ur. He was a pagan. He had an old wife who had passed childbearing age, and he promised that he would give them a child. And Abraham believed. He followed God. It was counted for him as righteousness. And they only had their child when he was 100. Now, none of us looking at Abraham today uh, that we will say he wasn't successful. But who was the one who did that work? Who was Abraham following? It was God that did this work in his life as a lasting legacy. He trusted in God, and God was the one who built his household. Shinar, Babel, different from Abraham. For many of us, we want to build a name. We want to build, you know, like those in Shinar. So remember the context. Who wrote this psalm? Who, who, uh, who was the psalm written for? Solomon. He was the wisest man on earth, but his household was built in vain. He was wise, but he never applied his wisdom. He had a huge kingdom. He lost sleep. He was an expert in music. He was an expert in agriculture. He was an expert in animal husbandry. He was an expert investor. He was an expert um, I was going to say tradesman, but not tradesman, but he was an expert exporter and importer. But his house was built in vain because he married women who drew him away from God. 
and what was his legacy during his time. It was a great kingdom, but eventually his kingdom was divided. And this was Solomon's folly. His foolish son split the kingdom he worked so hard to build because except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Now here Solomon uses the illustration of children and the fruit of the womb to make a point that inheritance, that success in your household, in your life, that is not achieved by our hands. These are the things which are achieved by the blessings of God. Yes, in the Old Testament, under the Mosaic Covenant, children were a tangible way of God showing his pleasure. Now, in the New Testament, uh, it doesn't say that those who are childless are cursed. But we have to understand this. Solomon was making a point. There are things we can labor over, but we can never guarantee. And children was one of those things in the Old Testament. Abraham was married for years, but there was no guarantee of children because Sarai, she was barren. And so similarly for us, we need to realize that we're never guaranteed a good business, nice house, smart children, a great marriage. When it comes down to it, the point that Solomon is trying to make is that even these things are gifts from God. If we pursue after God, then he will bless us with immeasurable blessings, chief of which he will help us to build up our households, you know, our business, our family, our children, the way he wants them to be so that we will be joyful and spiritual. And only God can give us a truly successful and spiritual household. So unless you're working to build it in that way, working to protect it in that way, you're only destroying it. And, and what kind of success do we see? Now Solomon continues with the illustration of children. Verse four says that his children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. Uh, verse five says that happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. You know, in, in those days, in the Old Testament, a man's success was seen in his weaponry. You know, if he could display his arrows, right? It showed his ability to protect what he had. And his success was also seen in the number of children he had, especially sons. If there were disputes, right, they would come to the city gates before the judge to work out their disagreement. And if a man were to bring his 15 strapping, strong, young sons, you know, to uh, in front of the elders, it would be a show of strength where they could also testify and speak against the enemies. And that's the meaning of verse five. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, dearly beloved, how do we apply this? Uh, I don't want to subtract from the context. So very briefly, yes, having children, uh, having many children in the Lord is a blessing. And I want to be the first one to testify of that. And we do desire that families in our midst uh, will continue to multiply as the Lord leads. That being the case, I don't want to subtract from the obvious application apart from the example of children. God blesses our lives. Our building up of our household, building up of our careers, families, and marriages, you know, when we let him build us up, then what we have will be strong. When we have a godly family, it is a great testimony. When we have a godly business, maybe a small godly business, but one that is run with Christian principles is a great testimony. A godly church life, is a great testimony. And we can never achieve any of these things without building in the Lord. 
You know, these things are ordinarily the results of a life that is built in Christ. Is your meat to do the will of him that sent you? Are you like Paul and Apollos? They planted, they watered, they labored hard, but they recognized that it was God who gave the increase. Or do you strive, do you labor, rejecting God's resource of rest, rejecting God's resource of your family, rejecting God's resource that he has given to you that may be limited? Do you reject those things? Do you ignore what he has placed at your disposal? Do you labor for things you already have in Christ by rejecting them? And if you do so, you may have what you want, but you won't have the best of that which God has revealed. You know, dearly beloved, what is God's word to you today? When we read Psalm 127, we see the blessedness of a life that is not vain, a life that receives the resources that God gives to let God build our lives and not us sacrificing these things to build our lives by ourselves. Well, I would say that there are several applications here. Firstly, evaluate what you're doing in building up your household, what you're doing in building up your job, your life, your family, your marriage. Are you working to establish and protect what you have without God? Are you building without God? Are you trusting in lying words and not in God? You know, the Lord Jesus, he came to do what God wanted. His food was to do his Father's will. You know, there were many times that he could have acted, but he didn't because it was not his time. At what age did Jesus begin his ministry? He began it at 30 years old. That was God's right timing for him. That is when he was baptized, that's when he was commissioned, and he waited for God to lead him. And when God led him, Jesus labored hard. And what did God say about Jesus? This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus did not do it by himself, but he waited upon God. Secondly, what can you do now? If you're vainly building and vainly watching, if you are at the end of your resources, what must you do? If you're not sleeping enough, the obvious thing is to sleep, to rest in God, and to trust in Him that He will work in your life and grant you success the way he wants you to succeed and not the way you desire to succeed. I, I had, or I have, I had, I have a good friend. Um, he was a very smart guy, but he also said he was not as smart as some of the other people in his cohort. He was doing a course that was very hard in school and he would come to church, but after church, he would return back home, and he had to study. He really felt that he had to study in order to succeed. I I'm, I'm saying this to help us appreciate the Lord's day and to trust in God's promise that his blessing of rest is something that we need. So this brother brought a friend to church was not converted, but converted. Then he came to church, and he worshiped God the whole day. He rested. He spent time in fellowship with the rest of the saints. He sang with them. He pursued after God. They were doing the same course. And this friend of mine said, you know, how can he do that? How can he ever succeed? And so my friend, he decided to spend time in worship to surrender him, himself, to surrender his desire for success. He worshiped God the whole day. Uh, he served God the whole day. And each semester after that, he was on the dean's list. 
consistently. And he is head of some department now, appearing on TV quite often, you know, and he's a great testimony. All because he built and he allowed God to build him. You know, our Lord Jesus always worked hard. There were times when he was so exhausted that he slept so much that not even a storm could wake him up. Some of you need that rest. This was very different from Jonah. He went out against God. He tried to resist God, and he was sound asleep in his disobedience. But eventually, the plan that he was chasing after came to nothing. Resting in God is doing what he wants you to, surrendering your lying words, your stubborn ways. And it may be so for some of you that there are things in your life that you're chasing for the sake of family, career, and whatnot, and you're sacrificing God's appointed ways. What makes you think you will have the blessings of God? But when you surrender these things and these desires to let God work through you, why will he not give those blessings to you? Our faith is paradoxical. It is not through strife that we obtain what we desire, but it is through surrender that we obtain what God desires for us. And that is why, thirdly, yearn for the blessings that God will give. You know, you continue to labor the way you do. You lose sleep, not worshiping, not serving for yourself, you know, because you can't imagine that God's gift of strength and blessing can be far better, you know, than what you can obtain by your own strength. It's wrong. You know, Christ, when he was on earth, he was tempted with building his own empire. Satan said, if you worship me, I'll give you all the nations of the world. And Christ did not bow down to Satan, but by his obedience to God, now he rules over all nations of the world whose people worship him with grateful hearts. Jesus did not believe the lying words of Satan. He did not turn stone into bread, but instead he ate the bread of sorrows. He drank the cup of judgment so that one day he will drink of the vine anew with his people at that great marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus did not believe the lying words of Satan to lift himself up by casting him down from the temple mount in order to be lifted up by angels because he gave of his life so that God by the Spirit would raise him from the dead to the highest heavens where now he is far above all the angels. And dearly beloved, we're all trying to build our household. We want to be like the people of Babel at Shinar gathering and building something great. You know, our household, our careers, our marriages, and we're sacrificing all of these things when we will not receive what God has already freely given him because we believe in lies. And so may the Lord flush our hearts this day with his love, the knowledge of his blessings, to convince us that his ways are better than ours. Let us pray. Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, accept you build our household. We labor in vain that build it. Father, we do pray especially for fathers and husbands being the heads of their households, that on this Lord's Day, even a day that the world celebrates Father's Day, that we will be reminded afresh of our Heavenly Father's promise 
that when we rest and abide in Him, building with His help, only then will we have the household that He desires for us. For all other things are vain. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.